Now we will start uh, and move on the afternoon panel discussion. This discussion is divided into three areas, data sharing, future of press, and cyber conflict. Each panel will have a representative speaker who will explain the topic and present discussion point, followed by a discussion. Now, before we start the panel discussion, uh, Professor Faber will give us an introduction. Professor Faber, right. Okay. Well, please. <coughs> uh, right, okay. Professor. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Professor Faber. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is a joke. John Wright. And uh, so, um, yeah, I just uh, have a, a brief introduction about Joe Ito, but uh, I don't need to. Uh, to introduce uh, Joe Ito, but uh, the data sharing uh, in, a, in a kind of a very much a broader sense. And then also, uh, uh, Joey has been uh, fortunately in Japan for a while. And then, uh, so uh, uh, he's been working together, but uh, uh, he's not physically participating in this. Uh, at the KU University, but uh, he's uh, participating from a remote. And so after uh, his speech about the, how long, ten, ten, what is the length of the session? The idea was Joey would talk as long as he wants, he wants. Yeah. and then we have a discussion. Yes, in the whole, whole session is going to be? The whole session is. Well, no. It's two hours, so we've got three panels. We've got three panels in two hours. Three panels in two hours. So 40, 40 minutes per panel. So now, okay, is that my responsibility? Anyway, so so 10 to, 10 to 20 minutes, whatever the length say you want to talk, Joey, about the you know, kind of a broader, broader context of uh, data sharing, and then they, you're going you're gonna to invite anybody to the panel for the discussion, inviting any, anybody for the discussion after that. So probably that's the way. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead, Joey, thank you. Hi, hi, hi Jim, thank you everybody. Um, I was told I was just on a panel and I didn't need to prepare anything. I can obviously talk a little while, but I just want to confirm with um, Katerina what the program is. Yeah, that's correct. I'm here. I actually sent an email to uh, Kauri. I cannot turn on my video for whatever reason. Um, and yes, we wanted this to be like an open discussion and not so much a preset speech on anything with slides that will never end. So what would actually be great if you could give us like a short um, update or kick off about your thoughts, what is the future of data sharing, what are the opportunities and what are your main concerns because this afternoon session as it was just correctly outlined, is three different panels, and we have picked three different topics that we think are important for the future of CCRC. So data sharing is the first, then journalism, and then cyber attacks and cyber conflict. So with data sharing, just one final sentence, and then I hand over to you. I think, you know, there have, there have been some changes, right? When you talked about this five years ago, the technology has um, further developed. So I think, you know, the whole context of algorithms and the use of new technology in the context of data sharing would be something that I'm very interested in. And I don't think there's much of research being done yet. So uh, if you could, you know, just share your thoughts and then I think we can all jump in. I'm sure there are many questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Katharina. So, um, so first, I think it's especially as we see AI picking up steam, I think we need to be very careful about what data means. You know, so, so you have obviously underlying data, but then you have data about data and knowledge about data about data. And um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions, um, especially in the context of privacy and regulations, about what in fact is data. You know, we've had um, intelligence agencies say that metadata isn't the data. Um, and uh, we see, for instance, in the case of Cambridge Analytica, um, they said that they didn't use data from one client to another, but they trained models that then they use for other clients. 
So, and this is, you know, the Cambridge Analytic conversation is um, kind of a very public facing, but, you know, but it's an important precursor to what we're seeing right now with um, generative AI, where um, we're seeing you know, images and content coming out of these models that, um, you know, infringe privacy, uh, potentially infringe copyright. And uh, it's a very uh, uh, interesting time where we lack both the sensibilities and the legal framework to understand uh, what we can share um, and what does sharing mean. And I think if you're a, a student and you go to a library and you read a lot of books, um, you have the right to walk out of that library with your brain intact. And in fact, you know, you, you, you have the obligations of, of uh, citing uh, people and, uh, and, uh, but you, you, you actually own everything that is in your head uh, when you finish reading those books. And so, you know, the question is do, what happens to uh, the models that are in AI? And so there's, there's a bunch of different layers when we talk about data sharing, there's obviously the ownership part and this is something that Katarina, that you and I have worked on a lot in the context of Creative Commons. And then there's also the privacy part, uh, which we didn't do as much at Creative Commons, but is a you know, big part of the Electronic Privacy Information Center and Berkman and a lot of places that we've been to together. And so the, the, the privacy part is pretty important. And, you know, and June and I have talked about this a lot too, but I think a lot of the regulations right now are very much in um, the prehistoric data land. You know, I think the early European uh, uh, you know, uh, data privacy laws were written back when we had mainframes, when you can actually delete things and know that they were gone because they were only in one place. And you know, the idea about the right to be forgotten and the ability to actually delete things, I mean, at least we try to uh, uphold those ideals. It's quite difficult. And I think with AI, um, we see, you know, um, uh, former Prime Minister Abe's uh, data free flow with trust, which is a very important Japanese national initiative to try to um, amplify the positive benefits of using data without um, impinging on people's privacy. This kind of balance between privacy and use of data is, is a really important centerpiece uh, for a lot of uh, what the government is pushing. Uh, my concern is that a lot of the policy discussions are not informed with the latest technology, both privacy enhancing technologies as well as the architecture of how data is being created and, um, and eliminated. You know, a lot of the data is about you must de-anonymize it, but we know from studies that even if you remove people's names, uh, you can start to infer who the people are uh, by the, uh, uh, you know, the underlying relationships if you have somebody's zip code and you have somebody's illness. Uh, or if you have somebody's location, you know where they wake up. So, so these kind of simple de-anonymization doesn't work, as we know. But a lot of the laws and regulations are sort of centered around that. So, so I think we need a wholesale upgrade. But the problem is, I think, at the policy level, people don't have an understanding of the technology or the architecture. So this is why things like CCRC are so, so essential. Now, I'll just I'm finish by saying that um, a lot of the work that we're working, we're doing with probabilistic computing and the ability to create uh, models uh, from structured data. Also because it's human readable and also because we can very accurately uh, write rules, um, we, I think we have an opportunity to make very strong privacy enhanced models uh, using things like probability computing and structured learning. I think it's a little bit harder with large language models and neural nets because it's harder to understand what's going on, it's harder to explain, and it's kind of harder to manage. So I think that some relationship some combination of structured learning models and some of these LLMs will have to come together in order for us to better audit and manage um, what goes into and what's part of and how um, these models are interrogated. And I think that's, uh, I, I don't agree. I don't think we can do a six month pause like Elon and his friends are saying, but I, I think that uh, we, we need to um, jump in and figure out what we want to do and how we express what we want to do both in law and in code. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I jump in with the question directly and then maybe we can hand over and see if there are any questions or maybe you want to invite someone first to comment directly on your um, opening remarks. You, you're, you're the boss, Katarina, so you decide what okay. to do. That's good. <laughs> I remember that uh, a while ago you did a class at the MIT, I think it was partly co-taught with uh, Jonathan Citrain on ethics and technology. 
And if I remember correctly, at some point you also covered the role of you know um, algorithms and and um, AI as it was emerging. And I remember one sentence. I hope I I remember correctly. You said data in is data out, and that means bullshit in is bullshit out. <laughs> Maybe I'm not <laughs> quoting you correctly, but I think uh, it's pretty clear what I mean or what I think, what I remember. So at that time, we were concerned that if the data that we you know feed into the algorithms are biased, then the outcome is, of course, also biased, right? And the, the, the top examples were usually like, you know, minorities not being reflected accurately because we already have that society that is not reflecting it accurately and so on and so forth. Now with, you know, um, AI moving on and even the data being fed into the system, being generated by another algorithm, how does that you know, come out? I mean, what is, what is the potential solution to that? Or maybe am I, you know, over, um, over cautious or overreacting? But my, my intention would, or my, my initiate reaction was like, oh, if a system decides what kind of data is being used to generate specific outcomes, then, you know, that, that is automation of automation of automation. Where is the, the human you know, supervision, where does that come in? Or do we not need that anymore? So, so I think it's important uh, to remember that, you know, the, 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 the AIs don't have preferences. The AIs have preferences that are reflected in what we teach it. And what we teach it traditionally is what we teach the past. So the famous case of the Amazon uh, HR model that tra was trained on historical HR said, oh, we don't want to hire women because historically women didn't do well in Amazon. And if you want the predictions to not be what's the past, you kind of have to put your thumb on the scale. But well, but machines shouldn't be putting their thumb on the scales, humans should. So humans can be progressive. Humans can say, we want to go this way or that way. But you, even in American society, you have one part of American society that wants to be more conservative, and another part of America that wants to be more progressive. And that has to be a political battle. That's not an algorithm. And the algorithm can only be an extension of the past, I mean, roughly. And so, so I think that, first of all, we have to remember that, that these algorithms should, if well designed, reflect human preferences. But human preferences are different from the past. And so, so even with pure, clean data, the default is we're just going to be project, projecting without any, any progress. So I think that's one important thing. Um, and I do think that, that the way, especially if LLM feeds LLM, um, you'll start to amplify the noise, and a lot there is obviously a lot of noise. Um, there was a paper that I tweeted yesterday, which was a which argued that because um, we we've been think, talking about watermarking LLM output so that it can't become input again, but this paper was arguing quite well that um, watermarks or any attempt to identify whether something was written by an AI is probably not going to work, and we'll see how this works out. But if that is in fact true. Um, the other part is that this, you know, this whatever bullshit or whatever will increase and be amplified and become even bit more difficult. Um, I, I do think the way I like to think about AI and um, just technology in general, it's it's like putting jetpacks on and going faster with less control. So I think if we're pointed in the right direction, we're going to go faster. Um, if we're pointed in the wrong direction, we're going to go faster in the wrong direction. And so I do think that the rules around technology are super important. But I think the main thing we need to do is put our get our house in order so the goal is right. So right now, you know, in the last, you know, the, the very sort of um, recent years of um, exploitative um, growth, it's been to get as much stuff as possible at the expense of others and the environment. And that goal is slightly shifting, but it's still the goal of many companies. And so if we're putting jetpacks on these companies, we're just going to see them careening in that direction. And so I think that more generally, changing the paradigm and the ch changing the way we set our goals, rather than trying to fiddle with the thing that actually executes those goals, because we can fiddle with all the rules that we want, but as long as our goal is destructive, I think that AI will be destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Last question from my side, because this is so um, interesting. Uh, how do you see the role of ethics in our teaching efforts, right? So I think at CCRC, we are mostly doing research, but of course, I'm also teaching a class. Dave is teaching, I think, two classes. We are all teaching. Rod is teaching a lot. 
Um, how should we add, you know, ethics as a discipline into technology in the broader sense? Is that relevant? How, how do you see that today? Yeah, I, I think it's super relevant, and I think that engineers like to solve. They like mm -hmm. to solve for X, and engineers. So engineers are very good once you give them a goal. Mm -hmm. But ethics is about figuring out what that goal is, right? So. I, 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 I tease MIT a lot. They used to have a conference called Solve for X, and they had this big campaign called For a Better World. And I was like, for who, at what time scale? Because better for one person is worse for the other. And I think ethics is to create the language and the framework so we can have a conversation about what's more important, short-term health care versus long-term environment. And we need to be able to have these conversations. And I think that a lot of people in Silicon Valley think that the life is a game and you can win and that somehow you can optimize your way to happiness. But happiness and preferences and ethics are all about trade-offs and all about personal and societal preferences. And unless we can have those conversations, there's nothing to solve for. And so when you're in a technical environment, I think giving people the tools for the language and the ability to think about and incorporate both the, the thoughts of society as well as yourself, um, to figure out what the questions are so that you can set your goals and have those goals constantly adapted to where we're going rather than trying to um, uh, uh, express the preferences of society. As, as Because I remember there was a lot of work around the early days of um, AN ethics to come up with a, a formula for good, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but there is yeah. no such thing, right? I think it's, 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 it's a formula for how to interact with humans to figure out what they want and what they think is good and trying to express that. And so I think they, they have to be much more, and then, the, and, then the, the, and then the liberal arts and the social science people often don't understand the technology. So mm -hmm. I think it has to come from both sides, but I think it's important, yeah. Yeah, great. And I think this is something that, you know, we at CCRC maybe can also approach to work closer between the disciplines. Thank you. Let me hand over and see if there are any comments from, you know, past panelists. Um, I'm looking at Murai Sensei and Kukuya Sensei and, and Dave Farber, Professor Farber. Um, do you want to comment on that? I think I think Murai Sensei, you have your microphone ready. Okay. To yes. Yes. I'm I'm ready to grab the microphone, and I think that Dave is ready to come up to the stage. But anyway, so um, right. while uh, Dave is doing that, then uh, let me start with. Uh, um, the you know kind of the question or comments or the ideas uh, uh, relating to this area, um, the you know the whatever the you know kind of a data sharing uh, type of a concept, then the, you know, the question always uh, is uh, you know for, for what and what do we need to to exchange the data for, right? Uh, type of thing and then, then so. Um, the, yeah, for example, DFF, they also are uh, the data free flow with trust, but uh, then uh, why do we need the data beyond the border? And uh, then they you know what for and uh, what the purpose. And then uh, on, the, on the other hand, then it's a very sometimes clear that, uh, you know, that the, uh, the, the reason why we share the data uh, it's going to be for this purpose, and then if that is the case, then you know, how are we go, we're going to deal with the privacy, how are we going to deal with the rules, and it's uh, sometimes uh, not that difficult when the target or domain is a specific. So, for example, the uh, George and myself uh, recently started to work on a, a kind of a, a medical data, hospital data, and then you know, the purpose of that is uh, pretty much uh, 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 define and uh, then uh, who to access and uh, who to manipulate and uh, then it's easier to create a model uh, by you know, the, the what kind of a data uh, format and, uh, to be analyzed for the future research and other purposes then uh, you know we can we can we can move forward but it's a very difficult uh, to uh, kind of un I mean working for the data sh sharing, uh, say, uh, you know, kind of a policy among the, between the two countries or among the mountain nations uh, without defining the way to, to use the data, uh, what's the purpose, and then 
so, so type of thing. But the, so the question is uh, basically, do we want to be uh, you know kind of a, a very much a general? I mean, to discuss and to define from a general way uh, to accommodate for the you know kind of a, a lot of possibility for the data sharing, or uh, do we start with a kind of a narrow domain to define the specific purposes and then in a develop new technology to accommodate that kind of a requirement? So that's that's basically the question to uh, your first to George. Joey? Yes, yes. No, I, I was wondering if we can ask Kokurio san what his his point of view is on this. Well, I guess I guess if I may translate what uh, June just said. Uh, uh, for translation. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. I I I I think there's a sort of a frustration, uh, but. It, I, I, I can s certainly feel the frustration in Japan because uh, there's a obvious benefits to uh, opening up the data for like advancing health care uh, for environmental things. Uh, I mean, th there are some areas where there there will be obvious uh, benefits uh, by, by by sharing data. And uh, at at the same time, I, at the same time, yes, I, I, I do agree. Privacy is important, and ethics is, is very important. And yet, uh, we haven't been able to very effectively apply technologies to to uh, accomplish both. And you you mentioned that there are technologies that that are being developed to. Uh, to achieve these two goals simultaneously, uh, and and yet, uh, I mean, when do we get it? Mm. And uh, what's the price of it? Um, are we are, are we not making things too too difficult? I mean, we see some other countries where uh, with a big, big I know with, with a big assumption of the uh, assumption that government can be trusted. Uh, things may be easy, but uh, I know it's not easy. Uh, so I mean, so when and how can we do it? Can I make yeah, a comment, uh, okay. Go ahead. Catherine? Okay. Yeah, I will make the comment. Um, in answer to your question. We've known the technology for, for protecting data for a long time. We can have an argument of whether it's this one or this one or this one, but there's no magic to it. You tell me what you want to do, we, we have the technology to do it. We can do it in software. If you don't trust the software, we could, in principle, do it even with hardware. The problem is that transition that getting people to produce data in that format, in that protection mechanism, and sharing it in that. And that's always been the problem, especially in the medical area. You know, all the medical records. The United States for endless years has had a desire to do uh, health care sharing, be big benefits. But that means that doctors had to have a compatible format which doctors did not have. It had to be privacy protected, which it was not. And so every five years, the, the NSF would have a meeting to talk about it, and the same people would get up and say the same thing. That yes, we, that'd be nice, but we can't change our data. We can't do this, we can't do that. And there are ways around that, but uh, it's very hard to do a clean cut and say tomorrow morning, but there are ways of transitioning. But I don't think there's a technological problem. There are several, including some of the new ones, who will solve the problem. The problem is, are people willing to make the investment to actually do it? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And uh, therefore, the, probably that was my mistake, that I, I, I use uh, you know, kind of medical data 
uh, example for, for, for this discussion. But uh, the important thing is that, uh, you know, the, when something, the, you know, kind of whatever the privacy is, I mean, the definition about the privacy and then the, we want to do this, and if that is clearly defined, it's not that difficult uh, for the technology to implement that, right? Other services and then the, the protection, security, and the other thing. But if uh, the you know the very much ambiguous and the undefined that what we want to do with the data, then it's a very difficult to implement or design the system uh, to accommodate that kind of requirement, right? Because the requirement is not clear, right? That that's a point. And then the, the, the reason why we are working at the Cyber Civilization Research Center is now the, you know, a lot of discussion in wherever the location, here, and the technology can support in here, and then the, there is a, a lot of discussion in between uh, to maybe define the requirement more precisely or the, you know, the showing the possibility of a technology uh, more uh, nicely by expecting what uh, you know, the society and the civilization is going to be, you know, the, the, the want type of thing. So, so the question is um, now, because this is an entirely assumption that the internet is there, and then the other technologies are there, and then probably the almost infinity of uh, you know, kind of uh, computation power storage or whatever data flow can be possible. But is that is that is so so? What do we want? You know, type of thing. Uh, very difficult to discuss because without understanding those technological architecture, then it's a very difficult to specify the requirements, right? And without understanding what the you know the human being wants to do on this planet, uh, then it's a very difficult to design the solution. So, so that I I, I believe that is a that is a situation. But we can ask Joey what his comments are. Yeah, yeah. I, so, so I think there's um, there's definitely a, what we want and a lot of things coming up. But I, I do think medical is a good one because obviously with better medical data analysis, we can finally do precision medicine. We can do research. Um, you know, drug trials are you know extremely expensive. And I mean, I think that, that if you look at pharma, it's basically bankrupt. You know, there's a bunch of ways they're still in business, but Fundamentally, the cost of doing research is so excessive that you can't really do it in an intelligent way, and we, we should be able to solve many of those problems with data. And so even just taking the low-hanging fruit of medical, you know, I, I feel like, so, so to just give you, show a little slide, um, so, so this is some work that we're doing that Jin and I are sort of talking to um, Fujita about, but you know, this is using um, probabilistic models to create uh, models of synthetic data. And what we're, what we're seeing is that the synthetic data so it is in red and the real data is in black, but we can create very um, complex and accurate um, multivariate models that look and behave where the synthetic data is, is, is very similar to the real data. And what we're able to do with this structured learning is, um, let me show you. So, so this is different types of synthetic data. The left is this um, probabilistic model. And so compared to statistical models or net, neural nets, the, the, these um, probabilistic structured models are extremely uh, similar to the real data. And so what we were able to do is if you take a bunch of data and create a, a, a prop comp model that doesn't have private information um, and you then use it to do machine learning, what we find is so this vertical is a prediction error and the horizontal is different types of uh, data. And obviously, real data is pretty good um, for prediction. Um, but what we find is if we take what we're calling a, a large population model or a foundation model, so if you imagine we could take a, make a model of all of the people in, most of the people in Japan, 
We go to Keio University Hospital and we make a model that uses the foundation model of all the people in Japan and takes the local data and combines them. We're able to get a model that's even more accurate than the actual data. And for example, with a, with a drug trial, you could start to do things like control arms and make them these um, privacy secure models that are then shared. And by having this foundation model underneath the actual data, you can create uh, privacy secure, but even more accurate models based on local data. So if we take every single hospital's models and combine them to create one meta model, even if some of the, most of the fields are different, as long as some of the fields have some overlap, you can take signal from this shared model. So if we create an a, a anonymous protective general population model, so we're calling this large population models for healthcare, for, for, uh, for HR and finance, for example, and we all shared it, all of our local models would become much more accurate. And, and this is an architecture that's now possible uh, using um, probabilistic programming. And because we don't have this model in the hearts and minds of the people making policy, uh, they don't even think about this architecture as a potential thing. But I think that this is something, for instance, that government should do. And there are many types of new models, for more, more new structures for doing shared data that become possible with new technologies. Zero knowledge proofs is another technology we could use. And again, I think what we need, and this is where I think CCRC can play the role, to be able to come up with economic and social models that enable very new uses of data um, that don't rely on this very old traditional um, um, de-anonymization method, but, but use some of these more advanced um, um, AI systems. So this is something that I'd love to try to talk about at a higher level sometime. Great, that's fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing it. Any other comments on this, maybe in particular? Maybe also from the audience, if there's any comment in the audience? Or question? Not seeing any hands here in the room at the moment. All right. Then I think we have like five or six minutes left. And Joey, I know you also have to catch a flight, but maybe we can go one more round. I think this is a fascinating um, starting point. I'm wondering how this could work between different countries. Right. So I think that, you know, it's, it's one point to have data and, you know, prediction within one country and in a society. And I would be grateful to have, you know, better prediction on, on what's going on. But the core, when we look what we can learn from the pandemic, one of the core issues is also to, you know, do this on a global level. Right. Is there anything that you can share? Are you already reaching out, talking? I think it's a lot about compatibility. Right. And then probably also how, you know, different societies um, see this. I mean, there might be different concerns coming from different regions, even if it's, you know, privacy proofed uh, or privacy safe, as you called it, uh, uh, data that's being used. Uh, have you, can you talk a little bit about yeah. the, the global perspective so, or so international perspective? Yes. On that? So I'll give a te te technical answer, but um, I think that what we can do so, so right now with neural nets, it's still very hard. Um, so OpenAI is trying very hard to tweak and fine tune it so private information doesn't leak and, and that, that it's, it's sort of politically correct. But with, with structured models, probabilistic models, you can actually program the preferences to say, so what we should be doing is as each country, each society should say, what are the things, what are the trade-offs that we don't like? What are the things that you shouldn't be able to ask a model? What are the things that should or shouldn't be in the, in, in the data? What kind of information is, uh, is private? And each country should be different. Each country's uh, or each local area should have, could have very different values. And, that, 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 and we should be able to encode those preferences into code that lives between the model and the person and between the data and the model. And we should have, that should be auditable and manageable. And we should have a programming language and a, and a system of governance for that. And, and I think we can do that. And I think that, again, this gets back to bridging uh, you know, liberal arts with technology. But I think the technologists can build it. Um, but I think that the, the, uh, the lawyers have to think more like technologists, and the technologists have to think more like lawyers, and everyone has to think more like ethicists. But I think it can be done. 
Um, and so, I, and I think it's a matter of implementing, and it's a perfect time because I think people are getting scared of AI, um, but we, but, and the meta is we're not very good at having the conversation about preferences in the first place. So I think this is something that we need to do, but Kevin, I think you, you put your finger on a very important thing and I, and I hope we can, um, you know, do this exactly um, in, in some of the work that we're going to be doing here. Great, thank you very much. With that, let me hand over to the co-directors of CCRC for any final comments or questions on this, and then we can close this topic and move on to the next one. Dave, can you, uh, do you want yes, to? Yes, I think that was an excellent presentation. The uh, discussion, the, I think the most important thing is that the, I don't believe there's any real technical impediment to doing it. And there's, a, and there's a will to do it that's needed, and there's a, attention paid to not just uh, pay, let me call them uh, uh, 5,000 foot papers, but let's go on and do it and try it and see if it actually pays off. Your second motion. So, sorry, can I just say one thing? Many of the slides I just showed are uh, produced by the MIT probabilistic computing team, which includes Cameron Freer, who's um, at KO and teaches a probabilistic computing course. I don't want it to make it seem like I made those slides. Those are, most, many of those slides are made by my colleagues I work with, so I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. If I, may, if I may comment just a little bit uh, before closing. Um, I hear June's complaint uh, loud and clear that uh, uh, the, the, the social science group is not defining terminologies like privacy uh, at, at, at an operational level that, that's, that's meaningful to technological design. So, and we need to, we need to I, I think task of uh, CCRC, well has been, but will continue to be, uh, you know, defining clearly what the goal is, and and then uh, articulating the goal uh, so that it's meaningful to the, to the design of technological systems. So uh, otherwise, we'll be going in parallel for forever. So and uh, I, I think that's uh, that's something we should continue doing. Yeah. So also, what I'm thinking is that uh, you know, kind of well, the the defining the domain to work. Uh, you know, having a solution, looking for a solution, and then the, the moving forward, this is a very important. So as they, you know, when we are talking about DFFT, I'm, I'm telling the governments the same thing. That, that, you know, don't just push the DFFT, but the specific idea to work with uh, internationally, which is uh, Katarina's question about the uh, nation to nation a relationship about the data sharing and then you know, so so for what and which and then you know what we, we will need I mean is that going to be a well security type of thing or the ID or the you know kind of that kind of thing can be defined if uh, we have a specific domain to work with. Uh, let me just add what maybe one thing in there uh, it may be also appropriate to uh, create examples. Uh, quite often, uh, you know, universities are great that way. There are students who just love the program and do master's thesis, etc. And some examples of, look, you can do it. This may not be the best way, but it's doable. I think would accelerate this. So I guess Joy has to Thank go to you. the airport. Yes, sorry, you were curious something? Joy has to go to the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm about to close the session. I just wanted to say a special thanks, Joey, for making time. Um, we very much appreciate your statement here, and we, we very much look forward to working with you and your team on this. I think this is part of the you know, goals of the session to show who is involved and, and what we are doing together. So thank you very much. Have a safe flight. Yeah. And with that, yeah, I can hand yeah. over to the next panel. <laughs> I think it's Dan on journalism. Bye, Joey. Thank you. Bye.